We are in week five of a series that we began in the, actually before the new year, but it's called Dreaming with God. And this series is a vision series all about finding God's vision for our life, finding God's dream for our lives. And we've talked about many different aspects of what it means to find God's dream. We talked about the topic of desire, how every vision begins with a desire. We talked about um, how to craft our vision and how God uses the different areas of our life to begin to craft the vision that we have. And we've talked about several other aspects and topics of, of vision. I encourage you, if you haven't uh, if you've missed a Sunday or want to go back and listen, you can always go uh, to our website or to our YouTube channel and catch up uh, on all of these messages. But today is a very important topic as we talk about vision. And the title of the message today is called Vision Invites Opposition. Vision Invites Opposition. I, I know y'all may have never had any opposition to anything y'all have ever done in your life before, but maybe I'm just preaching to me. Uh, this morning, but vision invites opposition. And what we are doing is we're looking in the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, and we are looking at Nehemiah's vision and his purpose of rebuilding the walls of the fallen down city of Jerusalem and how God called him to go back and initiate the rebuilding of Israel's walls after the city was destroyed. And Nehemiah has had a vision He's had favor with God. He's had favor with the Assyrian king who he was serving to go back to Jerusalem. Last week, we looked at how he went back and they began to build the city back. And they began the restoration of the city. And we've read a couple of verses. We've seen a couple of verses so far that I haven't elaborated on. That today we want to elaborate on these. So we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 2. And just like last week, we can't cover everything that we're going to talk about in the chapters uh, that are upcoming. But I want to encourage you to take some time, if you have some time, to read through these chapters that we're going to talk about today. And specifically, we're going to be talking today about chapters 4 and chapter 6 in Nehemiah. But the setup for chapter 4 and 6 is chapter 2. So I want us to look together in chapter 2, beginning with verse number 10. After Nehemiah was called to go back and to rebuild the walls, here is what the scripture says in chapter. Oh, I think we might have went. Sorry, throw our scripture there. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10. Here's what verse 10 says. When Sanballat, and Sanballat is a Horonite, and he was a governor of Samaria, which was the neighboring, the northern neighbor to Jerusalem's north. And Tobiah, the Ammonite official, who was an official to uh, the nation to the right of Jerusalem, when Sanballat and Tobiah heard about this, about the rebuilding of the wall, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Because Jerusalem was once the capital of Israel at this time. It was a mighty city with the king ruling and reigning there. But now it's laid in ruins. And the people that benefited from Jerusalem laying in ruins was the neighboring nations. So those to the north, those to the east, the south, all of those surrounding Jerusalem benefited from Jerusalem being in ruins. So when the governor of, a, of Samaria and Tobiah, the Ammonite, heard that someone was coming to rebuild the city, it disturbed them. And then it says, if you were to read on in Nehemiah chapter 2, and you were to go to verse number 18, this is when Nehemiah rallied the people, and they said, let's rise up and rebuild. Here's what they say in verse 18. Verse 18, it says, so they began this good work. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? And I, Nehemiah, answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. So immediately, immediately, when Nehemiah 
began to rebuild the city, even before he began to rebuild, when people just heard that he was coming to rebuild the city, he already had opposition. He already had people lined up in order to stop what their hearts had set out to do and the vision they had of rebuilding Jerusalem. So we have these two verses in chapter number 2. But then if you were to continue reading chapter 4 and chapter 6, chapters 4 and 6 go into great detail on what this opposition looked like because it was great opposition. Now just like last week, we don't have time to read through all of chapter 4 and all of chapter 6. But I want to summarize these chapters uh, to give you an idea of what's going on. In Nehemiah chapter 4, Nehemiah experiences external threats and mockery. They continued to threaten the people of Israel. They continued to threaten Nehemiah. They began to mock them and to ridicule them in order to get them to stop. They intimidated them with threats of physical harm and attacks. So they were intimidated. They were harassed. They were threatened, they were mocked by those on the outside. And not just those on the outside, but the Israelites who were rebuilding the city. Now that's not an easy job. it's, It's a construction job to rebuild. It's tough. It's hard labor. So there was internal discontent and weariness. The people, there were complaints from the people. There was weariness among the Jewish workers because the task seem too big for them. And you find this in chapter 4. Then you go over to chapter 6, and the threats didn't work, and the intimidation didn't work from Sanballat and Tobiah. So they began to be deceptive. So they said, hey, Nehemiah, why don't you come off the wall and meet with us? We want to give you an invitation to meet with us. And so there was deceptive invitations to try to lure Nehemiah away from his work. And then there was false accusations. They began to falsely accuse false prophets, rose up and spread rumors and false accusations against Nehemiah. Then there was attempts to discredit Nehemiah. And so you have all of this happening in chapters 4 and chapter 6. Intimidation, threats, opposition, mockery, deceptions, accusations. But in the midst of all of this happening in chapter 4 and chapter 6, Nehemiah stayed faithful. Nehemiah kept his eyes on what he had set out to do, and that is to rebuild the wall. So one thing Nehemiah does, he responds in prayer. Nehemiah is always seeking God's help. He's always seeking God's strength. He continues to stay organized. He organized the workers to continue the construction, oftentimes working with tools in one hand, and a weapon of defense in the other hand, just in case they were to become attacked. They had to continually be on guard for the enemy. He encouraged the people with the vision. He kept the vision before them. He discerned the deceptions and stayed focused on the task. He refused to be distracted. He made the statement in Nehemiah 6, 11, should a man such as I who's doing this good work run away? Should I just run away from what God is calling me to do? No, I'm going to stay and I'm going to be faithful. So even in the midst of these attacks and threats and accusations, Nehemiah stayed faithful and he relied on God. So I just want you to know, I'll bring you a happy thought. Vision invites opposition. So if you don't like opposition, which I don't like opposition either, You just need to know, vision invites opposition. Because here's what vision does. Vision comes in challenging, let me put it this way. Vision invites opposition because vision challenges the status quo. Vision looks at what you see and says, I think what I see can be different. I think my life can be different. 
I think my relationships can be different. I think my home can be different. I think my church can be different. I think the city can be different. I think the world can be different. I think the situation can be different. I think all these things can be different. So vision comes to what you see is not what you desire anymore. And when you have vision, it challenges the norm. It it challenges the status quo. Vision will look to replace what is with what will be. But here's the problem. We're comfortable with the what is in many cases. We're comfortable with the what is. People are comfortable with the way things are today. And if nothing ever changed, then that would be great. But here's the problem. The problem is, if you're going to go forward, you have to go forward with vision. But then vision challenges the norm and the status quo. So if we're going to move forward into what God has for us in our lives, in the areas of our life, here's what we have to do. We have to make the comfortable uncomfortable. You see, because Sanballat and Tobiah, they were comfortable having Jerusalem in ruins. They liked it. It was an advantage to them. So when Nehemiah comes back and he's like, I'm going to rebuild the city, they're like, oh, we can't let this happen. We have to stop them because they're making us who are comfortable uncomfortable. But in order for God to do what God wants to do, you have to make the comfortable uncomfortable. It's often said that Jesus came to comfort the afflicted, but also to afflict the comfortable to get us out of our comfort zones, to get us out of the things that we are used to. And so because those that were comfortable had strong feelings and responses about what Nehemiah was doing, opposition came. So if you're going to do anything worthwhile in life, it's going to invite opposition. Anytime you start to do something, you're going to face opposition. And sometimes it may not even be like harmful opposition. Let me give you an example. Have you ever been like, all right, today is Monday. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose weight this week, and I'm going to eat right. And then literally 10 minutes later, y'all, your best friend calls you up. Hey, you want to go down to the buffet? And you're like, uh, yeah, yeah, let's go. <laughs> you know how that is, and you're like, ah, and then you just blew it. Like anytime you, anytime you set your mind to do something different in your life, something is going to come along to get you off course. Something's going to come along. You know, well, this is the year. I'm finally going to save money this year. You know, I'm going to have a big savings account at the end of the year. You know, and then the car breaks the next day. You know, and then you got to spend $1,000 getting the car. And you're like, man, this was the year I was supposed to save money. Now everything bad is going on. And I'm overwhelmed with all this stuff. It just seems like that anytime you start to do something, some form of opposition, some form of distraction, Some form of something to frustrate you will come along in your life to try to get you off course of what your vision is. That's what we're talking about in life. So Nehemiah faced two forms of opposition. External opposition, those that come from Sanballat and the people, and then he faced internal opposition from those in Israel who got tired, who wanted to give up, who got weary. And so we face in life oftentimes external opposition, where we feel like people are bringing the battle to us. And we also face internal opposition, where it feels like we are just battling within ourselves. We're battling our own desires. We're battling our own flesh. We're battling our own old mindset. So when you set your mind, I'm going to go out and change something in my life. I'm going to do something different. You know what happens? That Those old thoughts, those old habits in your life are going to rise up and continue to cause you fits and give you problems because that's just the nature of vision because you're setting out to challenge the norm, to challenge the status quo. And when you do that, it makes the comfortable uncomfortable. So here are some examples of oppositions and distraction. External oppositions and distractions can be criticism or mockery. It could be naysayers or doubters. It can be competitive people that want to come and compete with you because they can do it better than you and they make everything a competition. You can face external of limited resources. I have a vision. I just don't have the resources to make the vision happen right now. There may be unforeseen challenges Circumstances beyond your control that come against you. 
Then there may be external pressures. There may be expectations of others that come against you, that cause excess pressure on you. All these things can come from the outside in. Then there can be internal struggles. There may be some sin or habit or mindset that causes us to fall off course. Hebrews tells us to lay aside the sin and the weights that so easily hold us back. There can be self-doubt and insecurity, internal struggles, relating to feelings of inadequacy. I'm not good enough. I'm not holy enough. There's fear of failures, that if I make one mistake, it could paralyze everything in my life. There's a lack of focus on the inside of us that we battle with. There can be procrastination that we battle with. Here's one for us. Impatience can be one of those things that we battle with. I want the vision to happen, and I want it to happen now. And we struggle with patience because we're so impatient at times. Lack of discipline. We may have a desire to do something, but we don't have the discipline in order to make that desire last, and we battle with a lack of discipline. There may be personal limiting beliefs, internalized beliefs about our capabilities that may limit our purpose. Overcommitment. We've spread ourselves too thin by taking on too much. And we don't give our focus to anything. And then a lack of clarity, a lack of understanding and clarity about what the vision of our life actually is. So we face a lot of opposition. We face a lot of struggles externally and internally that we must battle. Well, Nehemiah battled these things as well. But the good news is, just like Nehemiah overcame his opposition, You and I can overcome the opposition in our lives as well. And I want to give you some ways that that can happen. So number one, write down these three ways. Number one, we overcome opposition by facing it not in fear but in faith. We overcome opposition by facing it not in fear but in faith. So here's the thing about opposition. You're going to have to face it. Here's the thing about external struggles with people. I know y'all don't like conflict. I don't like conflict, but sometimes we just have to face it. And I know we don't like to look inside of us. We don't like to look at the things we're dealing with on the inside, but guess what? We have to face those internal struggles on the inside of us. If we're going to see the vision fulfilled, we must face those internal things. But the good news is you can face these things not in fear, but in faith. So with these three points, I want to give you three tactics of opposition. Here's the first tactic of opposition, the first tactic it uses, fear and intimidation. Fear and intimidation. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 14 says this. Here's what Nehemiah told the people. Do not be afraid of them. That's the word. Do not be afraid of them. They're threatening you. They're mocking you. They're intimidating you. They say what you're doing is too big. They say you'll never accomplish it. There's continue to talk and give you doubt, but don't be afraid of them. And he says this, remember the Lord. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. He is great and awesome. He is great and awesome. So when you have people coming against you and you're trying to live for God and you're trying to fulfill your God-given vision and people come against you, Nehemiah is saying they're not really coming against you. They're coming against God. They're coming against God. So he says, don't be afraid of them because this isn't your battle anyway. This isn't your battle to fight anyway. It's God who's going to fight for you. He says, so remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Remember the Lord. He says, and fight for your families because the vision really isn't about you. We've talked about it. The vision is for others. Remember your families, your sons and your daughters. You're fighting this for them. You're making the changes for those that are coming after you. Remember your wives and your homes. Remember why you're doing this. And don't give in to the intimidation. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 9 says, But we prayed to God to set a guard of protection against those coming against us day and night. We prayed for God's continual protection. Because fear and intimidation comes through the senses. Fear comes through what you see. Fear comes through what you hear. Fear comes through how you feel, what you think. But faith doesn't come through the senses. Faith comes through the spirit. 
Faith comes through the Spirit. And so this battle, if you will, that we're fighting isn't flesh and blood. Isn't flesh and blood. Because one thing that Nehemiah knew, even though he had physical enemies, this was a spiritual matter. This was a spiritual matter. There's a quote I came across in preparing for this message. It says, if you don't bump into the devil every now and then, perhaps you're going in the same direction. Think about that. If you don't bump into the devil every now and then, perhaps you're going in the same direction. Now, I am one of those, just so you know, I am one of those that I don't look for devils around every corner. All right, I don't look for the devil around every corner. I look for Jesus around every corner. I don't look for the devil behind every door. You know, you know if, if I got up this morning and my car didn't start because my battery died, the devil didn't make my car battery die. All right, if my washing machine was broke, the devil's not in my washing machine. You know, none of that. However, saying that, I will say this. We do have spiritual opposition. Or I like to put it this way. There is the unseen behind the scene. There is the unseen behind the scene. Most of the time, if we have external struggles, it's because there's something internal going on on the inside. Here's the thing that frustrated me and still frustrates me to a degree with church, the way we've kind of known church in the past, is that church and preachers have been really good at preaching against the things that people do. You know, don't go out and get drunk. Don't go out and do this. Don't go out and do this. Don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do. And we just preach at the stuff that people are doing. You know what I found out one day when you get to real life? The stuff that people do, our actions, are just a manifestation of a root cause that people are dealing with on the inside. It's just a root cause. But we tell people, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. And we preach against this and preach against that and preach against that. But we never deal with what's on the inside that causes the person to do that. We just think we take care of the external. You'll never take care of the external thing until you get the internal things right. Because the external things are just a byproduct of the internal things. That's why we do things like offer an addiction recovery class. Because I'm just not going to stand up here and preach against addiction because most people I've known that dealt with addiction, they didn't want to be addicted. And me preaching at them, telling them how bad they are and how bad sinners they are, isn't going to do any good. They just want to know how to get out and how to deal with the internal things that led to their addiction. And that's what we want to do. Come along and support and help and process those things on the inside so that people can truly be free. Because listen, if preaching against stuff could rid the world of sin, there wouldn't be any sin anymore. It's not preaching. It's allowing the Holy Spirit to minister to the inside of us to bring about renewal and healing and hope and moving out the old stuff from the old life and learning how to walk in the Spirit. So when we face intimidations and we face fear, here are some things you need to realize as a Christian. Here's some things you need to realize as a Christian facing fear and intimidation. Your enemies are already defeated in Jesus. Your enemies are already defeated. As a Christian, we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory because you've already been given the victory in Jesus Christ. Here's what we do to battle intimidation and fear. We reject the voice of fear by the enemy. We reject the voice and the words it's telling us. And then we talk back to it. We talk back in faith. We use words of faith. We use words of of confession. We realize that God is for us, he is with us, and he loves us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? We learn that we are not a victim, but we are an overcomer. We are more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. You are not a victim of your circumstance. You are an overcomer in Jesus. You are somebody who doesn't give up and you push through. And the, great, and the most powerful thing about you is that you're still here in, fi- in spite of everything that's tried to tell you otherwise. You are still here and you are still standing. And everything you've gone through, you've made it through. You are an overcomer. And never doubt that you are an overcomer. You can worship through your warfare. You can worship through your warfare. You can posture your heart toward God. You don't have to give in to fear. You can overcome fear and face opposition by faith. 
That's what Nehemiah did. He did it with the strength and the help of God. Here's number two. I'm going quickly. Number two, we overcome opposition by keeping the focus on the vision before us. The second tactic of opposition is distraction. Distraction. The devil doesn't have to destroy your life in order to make you ineffective. He doesn't have to destroy your life to make you ineffective. He just has to distract you. He just has to get you distracted. He has to get your eyes off of the vision. He has to get your eyes on the opposition to lose your purpose. Here's what Nehemiah 6.3 says. I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Nehemiah says, I'm doing a great work and I can't come down. I can't quit. Why should I stop and leave this work to come down to those who just want my eyes off of the vision? So we must recognize and discern the things that come to distract us. And we must be intentional about staying focused. That's why so many times we spend time just talking about the problem. Have you ever noticed that? We spend time talking about the problem. Talking about the problem. In our relationships, we just talk about the problem. Talking about the problem between us. What's the problem? The problem. We bring up, here's, here's my problem with you. And, well, here's my problem with you. you know? What about in, I mean, in our world, politics, just talking about the problem. If they can just keep the problem before you. Have you ever noticed there's more talk about the problems than there is about solutions? There's more talk about the problems, the problems, to keep your eyes off of the solution, to keep your eyes off of the vision, to keep you distracted. So we must recognize and discern the things that come to distract us and be intentional about staying focused. Here's why you need to be intentional, because vision creates unity. Vision creates unity. Nehemiah kept the vision before the people, and that's how he kept them working together. Here's another thing we must be focused on, priorities and boundaries are guardrails to stay on the road to vision. You must set priorities and boundaries in your life if you want to stay focused. Because the scripture says where there is no vision, the people perish. It literally means they cast off restraint and they go wild. They have no, your vision creates boundaries and priorities that act as guardrails in your life so you don't run off course. Here's another big one to stay focused. You need to be aware of what you're feeding on. You need to be aware of what you're feeding on. And I don't mean food. I mean the things that you're looking at constantly. The things that you're hearing constantly. The words you're hearing constantly. The things that you're thinking about and dwelling in your mind constantly. Every one of those things affects you. Everything that goes into your senses is affecting you. That's why it's so easy to get distracted. And we live in a world where there's a hundred billion distractions at every moment of every day. We must be aware of what you're feeding on. You must limit the negativity. Here's another thing. We must learn to say no. We must learn to say no. Not every good opportunity is a God opportunity. You must learn what to say. No. I had one person tell me one time, how do I know what God's called me to do? I said, eliminate the things he's not calling you to do. You've got a lot of things on your plate. God may not be calling you to do all those things. Start, start saying, here's what God doesn't want me to do. And then you'll figure out the thing he does want you to do. Here's another thing we must recognize and discern. We must decide what deserves your time. Time is one of the most valuable assets that you and I have. And you must discern what and who deserves your time. Because what you give your time to is what you're giving your energy to. And some things you're giving your time to is draining you of your energy, is draining you of your focus. And so you need to decide what and who deserves your time. And then we must use spiritual disciplines to orient our heart to God. Because all these issues are heart issues. Vision is a heart issue. So those are ways that you can stay focused and not fall under the tactic of distraction. Then number three, finally this morning, we overcome opposition by developing what we call vision resilience. Vision resilience, and that is being resilient. Being resilient. Here's what vision resilience is. Vision resilience is the ability to endure and to bounce back from challenges while staying committed to the vision. Having vision resilience means that you get back up when you fall down. 
Having vision resilience means that you bounce back when faced with setbacks. It means you don't give up when things get difficult. Here's another word for vision resilience. Endurance. That you endure through what you're facing. So this tactic, this tactic number three, is giving up. If the enemy can get you to give up, to stay down, to walk away, and that's one thing that Nehemiah says. He says, why should I quit? Why should I walk away? Why should I stop doing what I'm doing? Because I'm doing a good work, Nehemiah says. Endurance is the key. Don't quit. Don't quit. Here's some temptations to give up. We get vision fatigue because we've done this so long and we haven't seen our vision and dreams come to pass. We get vision fatigue. We get weary because we get tired and worn out. We face setbacks, things that come up that we didn't expect. We face delays. We thought we'd be further along today than we were. We face detours. We thought God was going to take us this way, but guess what? God took us this way. We face people coming and going in our life. People thought we would be with us and stand with us are no longer with us. It's, it's that one thing. Jesus, I'll be with you to the end, and then he's denying Jesus. But then you have people coming in your life. Some will support, some, some won't. So there's every opportunity to give up, to quit. But here's what vision resilience says. Vision resilience says, I'm going to keep going no matter what. No matter how many times I fall, I'm going to get back up. No matter how many times I failed, I'm going to keep trying. No matter how many setbacks I've had, no matter what detour I have to take, I'm going to keep driving. No matter who's with me and who's not with me, I'm going to keep going. I thought I'd be further along, but you know what? I'm going to keep going. I'm going to roll with the punches because I know ultimately God is working these things for my good. And I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to have vision, resilience, and I'll see my setbacks. I'll have a comeback from all of that. I may be down, but I'm not out. I'll see my obstacles as opportunities to grow. I'll see my failures as a simply as an elimination of what didn't work. And I'm going to keep going. When you have vision resilience, when you keep the vision before you, and when you operate in faith, it doesn't matter what's coming against you because you're going to be standing. And God's got you right in the palm of your hand, of, of his hand. And I want you to know, keep going. You're doing better than you think you are. You're further along than you think you are. Yeah, you thought you'd be here, but you know what? You're exactly where God has you to be. Trust him. He knows everything that you've gone through. He knows every hurt. He knows every opposition. He knows every failure. He knows everything in you. And you know what? He's still riding with you. He's still right there. He's still a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So when the opposition comes, we're not going to fold. We're not going to be in fear. We're not going to quit. We're going to stand strong and say, you know what? I'm not coming down off this wall. I'm staying. I'm working. And I will see the victory in my life. May we stand together this morning.